Today on Between the Lines, something very different when we meet Tim Vanderhoek, the man who recently bought the social network MySpace. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Tim, along with his brothers Chris and Russell Vanderhoek, founded the company Specific Media, a global interactive company that few have heard of until their recent purchase of MySpace. And they're joining forces with Justin Timberlake to revive this iconic brand. My conversation with Tim will give us a first-hand account of what it's like to be an entrepreneur, the importance of effective leadership, how a brand like MySpace can be revived, and most importantly, the future of social networking and its effect on our lives in the Internet age. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by the government of Puerto Rico's tourism company, encouraging viewers to take a break and relax with a good book. Every page brings a new and exciting experience. Puerto Rico, we book romance. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And that is the person who did. Tim, it's a pleasure to have you here on the set. Uh, welcome to Between the Lines. Yeah, thanks for having me, Barry. It's great to be here. Now, this, is, in a sense, is a first. I said to people at the introduction that there's a difference here because there's no book, there's no art, there's no film, there's no theology, no physics. It's just me and you chatting because I was so fascinated when I read that someone picked up MySpace because I always couldn't help but wonder what the heck happened to that thing? It was yeah. one of the great brand, iconic brand names. And when I saw this, I said, you know, we've discussed business, we've discussed leadership. I really wanted a chance to sit down with a true entrepreneur who's in the process of the new social media. And, and I thought this would be an interesting way to start. So I'm gonna bridge the gap all the way from leadership and entrepreneurship all the way back to MySpace. Perfect, I'm excited to do it. So let's start with the true entrepreneurship. Yep. And that was Specific Media, which you formed with your brothers, Chris and Russell. Yep. Now, I had just on before uh, John Izzo, who talked about taking responsibility and stepping up. One of the keys of entrepreneurship is seeing a need, taking responsibility, yep. stepping up, and do something. What is it that sparked, not so much I, the, the what is it that sparked, but how did that spark feel when it hit you? Yeah, I think for, for me personally, it was about making a mark in society. And the best way for me to do that from what I knew was entrepreneurship, to build something from nothing. And I think that is really the passion that I had internally, for, uh, internally from a very young age, um, to basically build something from nothing. And so as I started to come of age, 14, 15, 16 years old, and really viewing the world from my lens, the opportunity that I saw where I could make a big mark was certainly on the internet. It started to blossom right as I was in high school. You could really see the power of what was coming. And I think at a very young age, I understood that the internet would have one of the biggest impacts on society, and I could play a significant role in that. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Well, the fact that entrepreneurialism itself has one of the biggest impacts on our society. Yeah. If you read about everything that's going on now in the country, it's all almost a, a begging for entrepreneurs to step up, create, and bring back jobs and do all of those things. So people don't realize the importance of that role in how it affects all of us on so many levels. Oh, that's, there's no doubt. I think if you look at America today, even the world in general, entrepreneurialism solves most of the problems. The idea of uh, bringing down costs to consumers, making things more entertaining, making life better, uh, creating jobs all along the way, creating wealth along the way, that is what society needs right now. And I would, I would love for more programs to be created to help entrepreneurs like myself, because although some have been created, uh, there really isn't a lot out there for entrepreneurs to use for financing. It's still a very, very tough and brutal world uh, for entrepreneurs. But you know, 
I, I'm laughing a little bit as someone who also was an entrepreneur and yeah. had to start something. That's and right. There's, there's almost something inherently needed that it has to be tough. I know that sounds kind of funny, That's, but if it was so easy and you could learn it in school, those aren't the kind of people that are going to be entrepreneurs. It's yep. the Thomas Edison's who don't mind failing a thousand times That's before right. they find the right piece of filament. That's the, the real key is that there is no lessons. It's all the fact of how you yourself envision the progress you want to make. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone always tells you it's the journey that makes it worthwhile. And I think in entrepreneurial, uh, being an entrepreneur, the journey is everything. Uh, once you hit a certain level of success, um, you know, you get a little bit more comfortable, but you're still constantly pushing yourself because you want that gut-wrenching feeling of uh, grinding it out, uh, barely making a profit from not making a profit to making a profit and reinvesting those profits back to make a bigger enterprise. And I think, you know, I'm going on now, we've done this for 13 years, and I, I still feel like you're just scraping by, even though you own MySpace now, we've created a, a business that's in uh, 11 countries, 800 employees. I still feel like I'm grinding by every single day, and I think that is the drive that pushes an entrepreneur. Now, the thing that truly separates entrepreneurship, in, in my opinion, is not just the starting of something, but how you lead it, how you are going to grow that child that's a yep. baby, basically. That's you know, right. how are you going to grow that child? And I was reading about you, and I, I saw these words when when it came to leadership. And and the key word you said was trust. The preservation of consumer trust is of paramount importance. And I remember having Warren Bennis, the great entrepreneurial business yep. leader, on the show, and he said, trust is a kind of love. Yeah, I think it absolutely is. When I, when I talk about trust, there's internal, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, there's internal trust amongst the employee base, shareholders, investors, um, certainly with my brother who, who runs the business uh, with me. And then there's external trust as well. And I think to, to gain that external trust, you have to be a true leader uh, of your team internally. And it's, it's about providing a vision, uh, having a tremendous amount of conviction on what's needed, what, what problem in society are we gonna solve what are we trying to fulfill as an organization? And once you have that vision and you communicate it well over and over and over to the employees, uh, they really do rally behind you and it gets the organization moving down a path where you can then gain the trust of consumers, that they recognize the value that you're providing them and uh, they're excited to get behind you as an organization too. Now, there's obviously a deep passion that goes along with this. You can't, yeah. you can't persevere without that kind of passion. I found though, what's interesting about passion is you can't teach that. That almost has to rub off by example. So that's something that, you know, you can have as many staff meetings as you want yep. unless they feel it from you and therefore trust and love the passion that you have, that will never translate, will it? Oh, never. And I, I think, you know, being passionate about what you're doing, there are so many people I talk to out there and they hate their job or they hate going into work every day. And I tell uh, anyone that works with me, if you don't love what you're doing, you need to find something else uh, because life is too short to not love what you're doing every single day. I love getting up, uh, getting dressed and going to work every single day. And, if, and I want everyone that works with me to feel that same way. Uh, and passion is something you can't fake either. Uh, instantly, people know how passionate you are about a subject or what you're doing for work or whatever it is that you're doing in life. Uh, and it's a certain level of energy and charisma that comes out of it where they know if it's true passion or if you're, or if you're faking it. And so I, I think for most people, they are looking for that true entrepreneur who is passionate about what they're doing. Um, and, and it's something for them to believe in and rally behind. You know, I had a guest on the show that made a point, though, about passion I thought was very interesting. And she gave the example of passion of the Christ. Yeah. And what we don't realize oftentimes is that passion requires also struggle. Oh, yeah. So as much as it motivates and, in a sense, brings the deepest form of happiness, it's not to say that there's no struggle involved. In fact, there's the more passion you have, probably on one level, the yeah. more struggling you're doing. Absolutely, and I think it brings up something else uh, that entrepreneurs deal with on a daily basis, which is fear. Um, failure, even though as an entrepreneur, it's okay if you fail, you still fear failing. Uh, you still fear whether what you're doing really is the right thing to do. 
even though you have conviction and you're doing it, it's also that struggle, it really comes from fear also that I refuse to be wrong and I'm going to push this forward and I know that this is what everybody needs. And when it comes out and you get that validation, that really is the, the end feeling that is, that is so big for an entrepreneur that you had the conviction the entire time through the struggle, you fought through all the fear, and uh, ultimately when you are successful and everybody validates it for you, that validation just recharges you to do it again. But the funniest thing is when you have that validation, everyone thinks you did yeah. it with nothing, am I right? right? So there was no, <laughs> he, what fear, he's a rich guy, from, so he doesn't have, but the truth is, as I said uh, even in, a, in another episode, you know, it's that overcoming of that fear, that is where the real courage and the real grist for growth in everything you're gonna do is gonna come about, and it is primal. It's oh, right from the beginning of time. Absolutely, it's from something deep inside of you as a, as a person, and I, I think for, for me, when, uh, when I really overcame my fear, it was, it was putting aside my age. I started the company when I was 18 years old, and the big uh, issue that I had was that I was only 18 years old, and you needed to fight through really was everybody looked down upon you because you were young. And youth, uh, although that's a great thing, it's one of the best things to have in business, it almost works against you. And, and getting through my fear of talking to someone who was twice my age, three times my age, had a tremendous amount uh, more of experience, it was something that was one of the fears that I had to get through. Uh, that, that was that struggle, that I had confidence in what I knew, that what we were gonna provide, and that was a, that was a big uh, issue for me in my early years but you know what, it, it leads perfectly to MySpace. Yeah. Because I'll tell you, here you built specific media, and let me just refresh people what specific media is to some extent, and if, if, I'm, if I'm off, please fill it in, but it's basically a, a very unique model on how to implement advertising and product and things like that on different websites right. and things like that. So you, you grew that to become one of the biggest in that field, like you said, hundreds of employees, 11, I think, countries, yep. and probably more now with MySpace. Um, and yet, just as you're probably feeling comfortable running specific media, you make that decision again, whether it's from passion, yep. that, that drive, whatever that is, I'm taking over this MySpace. That's right. And for the big thing for us, being uh, born and raised in Southern California, uh, Chris and I looked at MySpace. It, it's one of the big internet companies. It's an icon on the internet. It was absolutely the huge at one time, the third largest property in the world, uh, and it was Los Angeles based. It was Southern California based. And and I personally take a lot of pride uh, being away from Silicon Valley, not in New York, with the two big kind of tech centers, and being in Los Angeles with the entertainment industry and the MySpace brand and, and company being Los Angeles rooted. It was something that we wanted to take pride in to actually bring back to greatness as well, too. So a little bit of it was uh, being from Southern California and having such an affinity for MySpace, which was the big first internet company uh, to come out of Los Angeles. We wanted to actually bring that business back, and, uh, and certainly we made what some people have told us is a dumb decision to buy, uh, to buy this company, but as all entrepreneurs know, when someone says that to you, you're on to something good. And uh, it, it's one of those things that, that drives you always, where everyone tells you, you've made a huge mistake. Uh, I can't believe you did that. You know, certainly we've risked, in buying MySpace, we've risked a huge amount of money and a lot of what we've built uh, to try and make this successful and this venture successful. But that's how I know uh, that we are gonna be successful because everyone's telling me it's a bad idea. <laughs> I love that. Now, one of the things you did bring in because you, you knew that you had the mechanism to as we'll say, provide the infrastructure, but you needed to somehow rebrand, you know, and, and that's never been done. In fact, I was looking, I don't think, in the real world, I believe Harley Davidson made a big comeback right. after its brand went down. I don't think of anything on the internet that has done that yet. So this is potentially a first. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, there hasn't been uh, a digital company, a website, a brand that was once great on the internet. Uh, actually rebound. And so for us, that as an entrepreneur, when we saw that opportunity, that immediately was one of the first things that we could think of. We could be the first to do this and really show the world that yes, a brand who once was great, who fell from grace, could come back and be great again. Um, with uh, Although it hasn't happened on a website, we're from a marketing background, an advertising background, and there are countless. The biggest, best brand today, Apple, was one of those companies. Target was another company that did it. Over and over through the course of American history, there's been uh, brands that were once great that went through a tough patch that came back. 
for us, it really the, the key to that is really starting with product. Uh, we're very, very focused on making the user experience on MySpace great again. It started off great, it got a little clunky, uh, and ultimately it lost its way uh, under News Corp's leadership and four different CEOs in 18 months. And for us, when we came in, it's all about putting the focus back on the user experience from the time they hit that homepage to the, to the very last uh, minute that they're on the website. We want them to walk away feeling this is great, this is something interesting, and it's something very unique that didn't exist. And we just want to entertain people. It's what MySpace should do. Well, you know, in, in, in many of the things I've read about you, and we talked a little bit about this before, it is content that everyone knows is king. Yep. And right now, if anything, content is missing from almost everything. I know that sounds strange, and I want to be very careful how I say this, but quality content that really help that really serve, that really enlighten, that really does something for people, yep. for, for the world, that's some of the hardest content to find. So one of my hopes when I read that was maybe this could be the, the, the type of direction that my space is going to go in and to provide, and then I read more about you and I saw exactly that is what you're thinking because you want the content providers to be it, whether they're niche, whether yep. they reach large demographics, whatever they are, you want them to be the creative force. And as you say, Tim Vanderhoek doesn't, it's not going to be your, it's your grand vision. That's right. But it's going to be truly the content providers. That's right. I, I think in having Justin Timberlake be involved, it really is you have content creators that are really running MySpace. Even though I'm not a content creator, it was what was important was to tap the artists themselves and say, what is it? How can we best serve, best serve you as a, as a musician, uh, as an artist, as anyone who creates content? How can we help you get what you do, your passion? How can we get that in front of more people out there? And if you really think of MySpace historically back at its core, when it really served artists and bands and musicians as that initial infancy, they were really helping uh, people who created music to get discovered um, and those artists to be found and get a record deal and then from the record deal become the next major great artist. Um, if you look at the major artists today, probably 60 or 70 percent of them started their careers on MySpace. Still today, even though MySpace has, has gone to where it is today, uh, the vast majority of pop culture was produced from MySpace. And so by having Justin come in and really help us as a content creator, uh, how can we help you fulfill your passions, that really is what his involvement is in the day to day, is he's helping us as a content creator describe exactly what he would like. Um, and he brings in many other content creators. He's obviously at the pinnacle uh, of celebrity stardom itself and being one of the great entertainers of the world. So he gets us access to many, many individuals who come in and say, this is what we need. If you could build X, Y, or Z, it would be tremendous for our career. But I want to take it one more step yep. where you took it. Because content floating around is just content floating around. I yep. mean, that's, you talked about, though, seamless connectivity. Yep. And there's no doubt, and I've had this discussion with many people, it is the connection we make with either the product, with either the community, with the social network itself, yep. with anything. It's that connectivity. Now, I know it could be thought of in two ways. One of it is being connected through all forms of media. So you're connected on television, internet, radio, uh, wh whatever, a mobile, yep. whatever it is. But you were on the bottom line, I was able to sense that you also wanted that connectivity to be something that the people felt connected with the new vision that you had for MySpace. Absolutely. And it starts with, you know, I, I think that connectivity spans many different things and it, it, it has a lot of different meanings to it. Uh, what we're doing with MySpace, we want MySpace to be a social entertainment experience. So when you find content, whether it be music, television, video content, movies, we want you to be able to connect with that regardless of device. Historically, MySpace was just a website. Uh, we just recently announced a partnership with Panasonic, which is putting MySpace on televisions. Uh, we're redoing the web experience now. Uh, we've upgraded the mobile experience. We've done it. I want you to be able to connect with MySpace regardless of device. I don't want people to think of MySpace as a website. I want people to think of MySpace as an experience, an experience that is where I go to be entertained and with my friends and with people I don't know that have the same passion as me. 
that is that true connectivity that we're trying to bring. Well, you know, you also, and I think it leads directly to what you said, is personalization. And in yeah. fact, when <laughs> I, I could never buy MySpace, but I'll never forget when I saw it falling down, yeah. I too said, MySpace, think about it. The name even implies my space. Yep. And it's not like I need five million friends. Yeah. I need my space that I can be with. Maybe it's book lovers, maybe it's uh, artists, maybe it's uh, people who like physics, maybe it's people who like gardening or bird yep. watching. It's my space. That is another element. You really want to bring back that personalization to the experience as well. That's right. I mean, connecting people to the things that they love in the communities uh, that, that sprout out of those things, like you said, whether it's physics or gardening, uh, there are communities out there that all of us are passionate about, and I don't think that there is a, uh, a great experience for that, for that to exist. And like you said, this is my space, and I want it to be representative of me, um, not so people can learn about me, but also so I can help find myself, learn more about myself. I think that is going to be that big opportunity that MySpace has. You know, in, in reading uh, the different things about you, you mentioned these words. You said, uh, I'll, I'll get, I wrote them exactly down, knowledge category. And I, I thought about that where, and where you say where the community can connect and discuss and talk to each other. And right in my mind, I, I remember being in college, and I remember the places called the Ratskeller or Patties, where the professor went right. with his students, and you just sat there. You were not in the formal setting, but you were able to connect with whatever topic, whatever passion you had. And I got a sense again that that's, if you could ultimately recreate that rat skeller from that yeah. college experience, that was the way it was going to go. But for, as you said, for all demos, that's the interesting thing. You're not focused only on that initial demo of 18 to 34. That's You'd right. like, because I know every grandma and grandpa that is connected on the web now, that's or at right. least a, a massive amount. We're, we're past the stage of the internet being for the young generation. I think what, what we are today is a connected society uh, through digital. And I think for us, it's not about building a product just for the youth or uh, the under 18 year olds. It really is about building a, pro a product that connects people with what they love, uh, their interests, their passion, their communities. If we can recreate in a digital space uh, what, what, as you perfectly described, what already happens in a physical space, whether it's in college, the library, wherever it was, um, if we can recreate that in a digital sense, it's going to be very, very big for everyone involved. SOPA. Yeah. And it's the Stop uh, Online Piracy Act. Yeah. And it's a very split community right now. And, and I couldn't help but feel you almost fall right in the crack. That's right. Because all the Googles and Facebooks and things like that, they, they actually blacked out. I mean, Wikipedia blacked out its site. They yep. did all of this. Yet MySpace, interestingly, is one that has legally licensed music for all these years. So That's again, right. if you're not comfortable with going there, don't. But if Happy you are to. comfortable, I would like your take on the, the act itself and how you see it benefiting or harming the, the system itself. Yeah. I think when, when you look at really what MySpace is, having, legal, having legal music, one of the only companies in the world to have done it, um, it took someone like News Corp to be able to do it. That was probably, that's too big for, uh, in the digital world, more innovation to happen. And I think it would, be, um, it would be smart for content owners to figure out an easier way to license uh, the content that's out there. However, for myself, uh, and being um, really representative of creators of content and really wanting to help them, I think from their protection, it's something that needs to be addressed as well too, that if I create content and I'm the owner of it, there needs to be better protections and controls that if it does get available uh, to a large group of people, that there needs to be better protection and controls in place. I don't think the current act as it's written was well written, and I think that's the big issue with it. Um, you shouldn't have unilateral powers given from one side or the other. There needs to be a uh, due process that goes through um, something that can be justified for the content owner's sake and for uh, a traditional website's sake as well. So, you know, I believe that content creation needs to be protected, that IP needs to be protected, um, but I don't think the current act is the best way to do that. I think we need to rethink this um, and create, a, and create a, better, uh, a better process to go about actually protecting IP. But I think IP should be protected, well, absolutely. You, well, you know, it's funny because you say that it's a community you want to build centered around content rather than around the individual. 
yep. and that makes then therefore the most sense that we need to just relook at that so that the individuals are their liberties are not threatened yep. and yet the protection of content is and that seems the the, the route that naturally you you'd want to take this in. no doubt I, I think when you think of what it takes to create content uh, it takes it takes a tremendous amount of time, effort, money, and that needs to be protected for the content creators to, to actually make a living themselves. Tim, I'm telling you, this is a subject we could cover for an hour. Believe <laughs> it or not, our time is completely yeah. up. I'm going to end with your words. MySpace, this is the next chapter of digital media, and we are excited to have a hand in writing the script, and I want to thank you, Tim, for sharing that script with us today. Barry, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Uh, it's my pleasure, and thank you guys for joining us. Now, before Tim leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words by Tim Vanderhoek. We want to tie social media with content and build a community centered around the content, a community centered around a passion. I'm Barry Kibrick. The best communities are filled with passion and content and all that is centered between the two. Thank you so much, Tim. Thanks, Barry. My pleasure. If you'd like to get in touch with us, want a DVD or transcript of our show, catch an episode online, or receive our weekly updates, go to www.klcs.org slash btl The idea of bringing down costs to consumers, making things more entertaining, making life better, creating jobs all along the way, that is what society needs right now. On this episode of Between the Lines, we meet Tim Vanderhoek, the man who recently bought the social network MySpace. Our conversation will give us a first-hand account of what it's like to be an entrepreneur, the importance of effective leadership, and the future of social networking and its effect on our lives.